Hello, hello. Uh, thank you all so much for joining our very first Purpose and Partnership events. This month, August is Black Philanthropy Month, and we are highlighting the importance of giving back to Black-led organizations in order to transform Black communities. My name is Jamila Tremio, and I am the founder and CEO of Ladies of Virtue. And Ladies of Virtue is a mentoring and leadership program for Black girls across the Chicagoland area. And we serve girls ages 9 to 18. And we are all about empowering our girls to become confident and purpose-driven leaders. Now, due to stereotypes, Black girls are viewed as needing less nurturing, less support, and less comfort than their peers. But we know that perception is not reality. And so we are providing our girls with mentors so that we can stand in the gap for our girls because we know that Black girls need to be supported, loved, affirmed, and we're here every step of the way. And so we prepare our girls for leadership in three ways, and that's character development, career readiness, and civic engagement. So that's a little bit about Ladies of Virtue. And today we are going to uh, hear from one of our love moms. We're going to hear from one of our love alum, and then also Franklin from the University of Chicago so that we can truly understand what does it mean to build a, uh, an authentic partnership. There is an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And so when companies and organizations partner with Black-led nonprofits who are oftentimes smaller and, and grassroots organizations like Ladies of Virtue, it can truly benefit us in so many ways. And so that's why I am proud to highlight the partnership that we have with University of Chicago. Uh, and actually, our partnership started eight years ago, and we're only uh, this October will be nine years. Uh, but I remember when I first started Ladies of Virtue, my vision was that uh, Ladies Virtue would be a pillar of the Chicago community. Uh, so yes, we stand in the gap for our girls and we mentor our girls, but I really wanted to be to meet the needs of the Chicago community at large. Now, I did not know anyone at the University of Chicago, but I did reach out and I just put my name in uh, you know, the newsletter so I can get the e-blast for their community engagement department. And I remember our very first partnership was uh, when we had their students to come and volunteer with us during Martin Luther King Jr. Service Day. And so that was eight years ago. And now eight years later, when I look back on all of the things that we've been able to accomplish, I can truly say the University of Chicago has been an incredible partner. Uh, not only have they helped us in so many ways, but I can just highlight a few. Uh, one would be, a brand credibility. You know, we were new to the community, but when we partner with the University of Chicago, that helps us to uh, leverage our brand and, let, and allow the community to trust who we are as well. Uh, we've also been featured in a number of their newsletters, so that brought media attention. Uh, they've helped us to build capacity, and so we've hired some of their graduate students who served as program coordinators, and I'm currently in the University of Chicago Community Accelerator, where they're helping us with fundraising. Uh, we've also been uh, able to access their community, their conference room space, uh, and internships. Internships is one of our workforce development goals. Every summer, we place our girls into summer internships, so you'll hear a little bit more about that. And finally, I'll highlight our community events where, especially during uh, COVID, we've been able to really meet the needs of our families who have lost their jobs or who had to, uh, who had reduced work hours and really needed that additional support. So we'll talk more about that. But throughout this conversation, you'll hear from Jackie, uh, who's coming up next, Sydney, who's our love alum, uh, and then Franklin on how to develop those key partnerships uh, that can truly impact Black-led organizations. So I'm ready to talk to our love mom, Jackie. Hey, how are you? Hey, Jackie, how are you? A wonderful, wonderful. Thank <laughs> you for having me here. You're welcome. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? We'd love to hear, or we'd love for the audience to hear more about who you are. Sure, I'm Jackie Scott, as mentioned. I have two daughters that are currently in your program. Um, Miracle is my oldest daughter and Heaven is the youngest one. Um, we first came across your program about two years ago. 
Um, and I was went to an event and they were um, giving out brochures about the event. Um, by the time I tried to apply, it was past the deadline. So they told me to try to apply the next year. Um, last year, again, we were at a back to school event and I got a brochure and I'm like, I'm trying to get in this program. And they were like, oh, well, the application um, is open now. The weakness is open. So I'm like, okay, let me go ahead and apply for my girls. And fortunately, we got picked to get into the program. So I was elated about that and they were too. Um, this is the first program that um, of mentorship that um, my family had gotten into. So we weren't sure, you know, what to expect by being in the program. Um, a couple of weeks into the program, instantly they loved it. You know, um, you guys had plenty of program, even myself, like I was saying, I couldn't join myself <laughs> as a mom. <laughs> you know, just the different programs as far as yoga, you guys were classes with yoga eating right, um, you guys have self-esteem classes, speaking about self-esteem, um, just um, classes even for myself about just having communication, better communication with your children, and your children having better communication with the parents. So um, it's programs that's just overall healthy for them um, to grow up as you know strong black women. Um, we also got introduced to um, different things. You guys have entrepreneurship programs. And, you know, it, it was things that I knew as a mom, I couldn't really um, show them or knew how to get them involved or open up their mind to. But because you guys um, have field trips, have field trips to actually take them to these different places and, and black women. Uh, entrepreneurships, you know, it was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And so um, I appreciated that a lot because again, it opens up their minds that you are here, but you can be there and beyond yourself, you know. Um, and the fact that you guys also help them to get jobs, you know, this year Miracle was like, mom, I want to work, you know, I want to give me a summer job. And you guys put the ad out there, hey, put the application in for this, whether it was, um, the different programs for the teenagers to get works in the mm -hmm. summer and things of that sort. She applied and she got picked for a job. So yes, I'm very appreciative. This program is awesome. It really is. It, 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 it was it, it was very helpful for my family, you know, and for them themselves. You know, again, to be strong black women, strong young black girls now, but to grow up to be strong black women once they become older. Um, so. Yes, we are definitely love and appreciate being into the program. Uh, and I love me some Scott family. I'm waiting, I'm waiting on blessing to come into Ladies of Virtue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she, she's waiting for her turn, you know, uh, um, because the program is so good. Now, I could just come and drop them off and leave. But like I say, even me as a parent, I'm just like, wow, like the programs they have, I want to join in too. Like I want them to come on. And so it's hard for us to leave, you know? So yes, we got a little blessing too. She's younger, but she she's she's waiting in line for her time. Yeah, she's <laughs> I love you guys. And even yeah. though this has been your first year, I feel like you all have been involved for so long because you come to everything. And I love yeah. that. I love yeah. when our families come and join and they take part in everything we have to offer. Yes. So you're definitely the poster child for that. Oh, um, thank you. Yes, I thank love you. it. Uh, and so another thing I wanted to kind of bring up is over the last four months, even dealing with COVID, you know, we had to, it was a whirlwind. And I remember when Governor Prisker was like, okay, we can't go, the schools are shut down. We can't go right. into perspectives. It was just a lot going on. And so I just wanted to uh, just kind of ask you about just the last four months, you know, as you think about everything that has happened, one thing that I really appreciate about University of Chicago is that they provided our first COVID relief uh, grants. And so that allowed us to then pay for groceries and uh, uh, send you all PPE kits with the mask and the right. gloves. Can you talk a little bit about how that was uh, a blessing for you all? Oh, uh, it was a tremendous blessing. I'm sure, like I say, this, this, this pandemic has definitely... Um, put a toll on everyone's lives, you know, and no one knew how to go, what to go, what to do, and how to go about getting things. So even before the pandemic, uh, well, they shut the schools down, 
it started to become a little hard trying to get necessities like disinfecting, you know, wipes and things of that sort, you know. But at that point, it was like, stay in your house. Don't go anywhere. You, you didn't know if you could go to the store or could not go to the store. Um, it's interesting because during this time, unfortunately, I myself came out of remission and I had to endure eight weeks of chemo. Mm. So I was definitely at the point where it was like, no, you don't need to, um, you really don't need to try to expose yourself to go to a store, you know, to go to the laundromat, to go out to your house, you know, because you're in a very, very dangerous place. I have nothing to defend myself at all at this point, you know, and so it was very scary, you know, um, it was very emotional. Um, and then you guys, it's, 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 and it's, it's interesting because even though I knew I needed the assistance, you know, again, with me being ill, I wasn't working, no little no money coming in. So you have the fear, fears of how is this going to get paid? You know, how are we going to eat? You know, and again, I'm going to need now to go through chemo. So I don't have the strength to even get up and try to make these things happen. And so a lot of fear set in, a lot of depression set in, and a lot of what am I going to do? How am I supposed to do this? And then up and behold, I get a phone call from you guys. Hi, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, um, we have, you know, funds available. And it was like, really? You know, it's almost like it's not true because it's like, when does the gifting stop? When does the giving stop from you guys? And it's like, <laughs> even during a pandemic, even during all this turmoil, guess what? We are still here. We're still here to help your family. And this is what we're going to do. We're not going to leave your side. And you guys found other ways to still, to still be a part of our family and help my family and the girls, you know, to be in contact with us. And so I was able to use those funds to pay for bills and to pay phone bills and light bills and things of that sort. You know, during that time, again, when you did go out and I sent someone out, because of this, the shelves were empty. Mm. They were empty. So going just to get necessities such as, I'm in the household full of females, it's me and three girls, sanitary napkins, it's like the shelves were literally empty. What are you supposed to do? You know, um, soap, again, um, disinfected. The shelves were empty and it was hard. And it's like, what am I going to do? You're almost thankful that they did close the schools because, again, we didn't have the necessities that we needed to go about our daily lives to leave out the household anyway. You know, and then, again, you guys came in with, with, with the essentials that were needed. You know, hygiene products, you know, um, supplies to clean with, again, food for us to eat. So we were very appreciative um, of this. And then, again, behold, the pandemic. And then after that, it was the issues with the... Exactly. And so, again, it's been hard. Even in my area now, it's still a lot of stores that are still boarded up and closed. You know, because of the looting and things of that sort, you know. Um, but again, you guys came at a time that was very needed um, for my household. And, and, and again, we are very, very, very appreciative of this program. It has truly, truly helped my family. And so um, we're at this point, we're like, anything we can do to give back, mm -hmm. you know, anything we can do to give back. You know, it, there's no problem, no problem because you guys have helped us so much. And it's a circle. This is what, especially during this time, what is needed is for us to help each other out. You know, just the small things are big, you know, just the small things, just the reaching out with an email or a phone call, you know, goes a long way when you're separated from your peers, especially with my daughters, you know, their, their, their friends were at school. You know, and so when you have people like your mentors calling and checking just on them, just to see how they are doing. I want to know how you are doing. You know, tell me that. You know, what is it? How can I help you? You know, that goes a long way because it's like, okay, someone is out here thinking about me, me as an individual. You know, so again, I am very appreciative 
of this program, you know, for my girls and for myself, because it in turn helped me because I'm not alone. It lets me know me as a parent, I'm not alone in trying to help and raise these children. That's so so I thank you guys so much. Oh, so you much. are welcome. You are so welcome. And Thank I truly really appreciate you, Jackie, for just sharing your testimony and sharing just everything that uh, you've gone through over these last few months. Um, and I feel as though we, as you know, uh, the leadership team and our love parents, I feel like we got closer during this time too, because we had yes. those support groups and we were able to really talk about, you know, some of the things that were going on. And so we'll make sure to keep you on in case there are yes. questions from the audience. But I truly appreciate you sharing your story and it's such a you. to hear that. And, you know, Linda just mentioned it truly takes a village. That's what it's all about. You yes. know what I'm saying? Like yes. we're in this yes. together. And sometimes just hearing that it, that this type of thing blessed you, that keeps me going. Yes. Right? That yes. keeps me going. And so and Janet yes. mentioned um, that she loved hearing your testimony. And I know oh, I did. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you. Uh, Jackie. Please don't go too far because we may be in uh, But I'm I right here. here. I know, right? <laughs> I love, I love, um, <laughs> but I do. Um, so don't go too far because another initiative that we're focused on is uh, that you did mention one of her daughters uh, was able to get a summer internship this, this summer. So that's one thing that we are all about. We are serving our girls and all we for them and, and providing that support for our parents. But during the summer, we make sure that our girls are in school. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Sydney, can you introduce yourself? Oh, uh, well, hello. My name is Sydney Lawrence. I'm a second year at Harold Washington City College. Uh, I was a part of Ladies of Virtues. Um, I know. I graduated from Ladies of Virtues mentoring program in 2019, and I was a part of it for four years. Um, one of the things I loved about my experience at Ladies of Virtue was our trip to Washington, D.C., where we were able to talk to legislators on Capitol Hill about why our mentoring program was so important to us. And that was such an amazing experience. I, you know, I, you know what I was going to say, because I love traveling with you guys. And it's been like, I've been so sad that we have not been able to travel this year. I truly love being in Washington, D.C., where we visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we were able to um, just get to know one another and just, you know, it's always good to take a step back out of our day to day lives and really just connect with one another. So, yeah, it's I, really I, good for bonding. I know. Like with right? each other and staying in hotels. <laughs> staying up. It's always mm -hmm. fun. It was so fun. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what skills have you learned in Ladies of Virtue? Um, well, for me, Ladies of Virtue taught me so many things from public speaking skills to time mm -hmm. management skills. And most important is how to use the things that I like and my gifts and talents to shed light on the problems that I see in the world around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I do remember your project was focusing on travel and encouraging younger girls to travel around the world, which is good. Yeah. Doesn't really apply too much now, but you know, right. <laughs> but it, it was good to um, to see that you know it was different. It was a different type of leadership project when you know usually girls focus on you know mental health or teen pregnancy or things of that sort but your group was focused on traveling. And so I do think that that's an important um, experience that young women should have. And so that was, uh, and that's one of the reasons why you won, right? right. Uh, 
And for those leadership projects, that is why we do those projects every single year, because it helps to differentiate you on your resume, because not too many girls have that type of leadership experience where they're getting over 20 hours of project management experience and actually getting a budget so you can go implement the project yourself. And so uh, what we have noticed is that our girls are getting phenomenal internship opportunities because they're able to have those leadership projects on their resume. And so I know that you have interned with the University of Chicago over the last two summers. And so if you can talk a little bit about your internship. Well, last summer and this summer, mm -hmm. I was placed at the University of Chicago Social Services Building with the Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention, which um, Franklin works at. And we worked on the Chicago 1919 Race Riot Commemoration Project, where I was able to use my creativity and love for history to shed light on this forgotten time in Chicago's history with images that I took which later ended up being published in Southside Weekly, um, Porter Gray Magazine, and will be in the American Journal for Public Health. Wow, American Journal of Public Health, that is amazing. And this is only your, your rising second year student at Harold Washington, and right. you already have these phenomenal publishing um, opportunities. So that is great, Sydney, you're doing a phenomenal job. And we'll probably hear more from you as well. But I do want to bring up Franklin uh, because you have provided uh, Antoinette and Sydney such an incredible internship opportunity. So if you just want to provide a little bit about that and then if you can introduce yourself, that'll be great. Well, absolutely. Well, first of all, just uh, thank you again, uh, Jamila. And you know, thank you, uh, Ms. Scott and Sydney. Um, and all of the viewers. Uh, my name is Franklin Cozy Gay. I'm the executive director for the Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention at the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago. And I apologize, I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what we do is that we support the coalition function and capacity of convene partners um, towards the successful implementation and evaluation of a prevention planning system called Bronzeville Communities That Care that's led by the Dean of the School of SSA um, and um, co-led and um, really directly, you know, the community lead and, and um, the inspiration behind this entire project is Pastor Chris Harris and uh, Bright Star Community Outreach, um, as well as a collaboration with Northwestern University um, with Dr. Hendricks Brown. And Pastor Harris, um, essentially when it comes to work, um, policies, practices that happen in the community. Um, he uses a phrase that was through disability action work um, in the 50s and 60s that is basically nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what we have done and provided support is around accessing public data with community stakeholders such as Ladies of Virtue and other stakeholders, residents, as well as six, eighth, 10th, and 12th graders to really collectively hear from everyone in terms of what does it take to strengthen community and reduce violence. Mm -hmm. And so the result of that is a community action plan with four pillars. The pillars include high quality programs for youth and families, education equity, the center of most of this work driven by Pastor Harris and Bright Star Community Outreach was around trauma counseling and support, understanding the pain, understanding that pe hurt people hurt people, but also understanding the structural violence and the impact that um, things that have happened in terms of our schools, in terms of our housing, in terms of our jobs, our access to sustainable economic opportunities and the impact that the justice system has had on black bodies. Um, essentially using those four pillars um, and, and workforce development being a key component. And that is actually the intersection that Ladies of Virtue and I have connected um, that actually began uh, nearly five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so um, the guiding principles for this work is around social justice, equity and healing and we thought when it came to our interns that one way to quickly engage them to help them broaden their lens of why Chicago looks like a tale of multiple cities is to really understand the, the origin 
of that mechanisms. And for us, we thought the best way to start with Sydney and with Antoinette was through the Chicago Race Riot Commemoration Project. I love that. And yes, we have to give Pastor Chris Harris a shout out. I love when he says nothing about us without us, uh, because that actually is something that I always incorporate with even with the girls, you know, when it comes to planning, when it comes to our curriculum, even if it's a flyer, whatever it is, I always get their input. And so he is right on about that. Uh, but I do appreciate you bringing up the internship because I do feel as though it is a phenomenal opportunity. So thank you again, Franklin, for opening your doors to Ladies of Virtues uh, participants. Um, if you can, I know that this is your second year uh, hiring our love girls. And so is there anything that distinguished Ladies of Virtue interns compared to you know others that you may have had in the past? Yeah, you know, I want to, you know, just this is really for all of our youth. Um, unless our youth are actually, um, you know, we build connections with them right away. A lot of times the primary adults that they come in contact with um, are adults within their families, adults within school settings, or within athletics. And so what distinguishes the ladies of virtue, um, women like Sydney and Antoinette, is that when it came to working, I wasn't the first person that they had had interaction with. Mm -hmm. You know, outside of those other adults, um, they because of the mentorship that was available through Ladies of Virtue, they already had an existing relationship. Sydney just really, uh, you know, succinctly described her amazing experiences that spanned over four years. And, you know, three of that was before we even came into contact. And mm -hmm. so that is a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I'm appreciative of having all of our youth and if anyone's looking they're like hey what about me frank you know but <laughs> I, to answer your question absolutely um there, there is a difference and we all all organizations everyone that's a part of this uh this this beautiful call today we need to keep in mind we need to mentor our youth um because we want to it, it impacts the next transition and so we mm -hmm. it was really low-hanging fruit for us to work with antoinette and sydney and i just really okay. appreciate that but I want to describe another component. So a lot of times when there is something about your student or your intern, whether it's their own personal background, their strengths, things that potentially might serve as challenges or opportunities for them, um, a lot of times you really don't have anyone to go to. You know, you can't necessarily go to their parents because you don't know them either. Mm. And so um, what the, the second thing that distinguishes is that I can reach out to you. Mm. I can reach out to, and say, hey, help me understand a little bit more. Mm. You know, if I need extra motivation, which is something that I did not need, but if I needed that, mm -hmm. I could reach out to you and say that. And that's exactly what I did, especially in the first year. Mm -hmm. And that really speaks to the, the, to the infrastructure that we have in the greater Bronzeville community. And thanks to the leadership at Ladies of Virtue um, to provide these opportunities for us because we benefit. Um, if we're not engaging our youth to talk about issues around youth violence and community violence, then we're not, we're not serious about doing this work. So mm -hmm. I just wanna thank you again for that opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. And you're absolutely right. I felt like we had a true partnership and someone mentioned earlier in the comments uh, how it takes a village. And, you know, we sometimes, you know, we um, we love to have our girls partner with other organizations because, you know, we want them to be exposed to a variety of adults as well so that they know, OK, you have to come to work on time or you have to do certain things. And so you are able to mold and shape them and really so that they can when they graduate from college, they're going to be crazy prepared like they're going to yes. run, run the world because of this phenomenal experience that they have had with the University of Chicago so thank you uh, Franklin for that uh, and oftentimes a lot of times when people look at partnerships right because we're a smaller grassroots organization University of Chicago is this long-standing institution that has been around in the city of Chicago for years uh, and so if you could just talk about uh, the mutually beneficial uh, aspect of a partnership uh, because it's not just that the smaller organizations benefit, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and part of it is really demonstrated through the this collective network that we have through the Greater Bronzeville Community Action Plan, that Ladies of Virtue is, a, a, is an important member that's convened by Pastor Harris and Bright Star. And what I've, you know, I have to be honest, like I've worked at the university um, this fall will be my 10th year. 
Mm. And um, five of those years was primarily focused on um, just being in our unit and then working in the community that we worked in. And it wasn't until the work that we were doing through these strong existing relationships um, that you are a part of, that Ladies of Virtue are a part of, that I saw that the key is around coordinating and, and, and working across sectors. Mm -hmm. And so what did that mean? Not working in silos, working with community members who are saying, you know what, we might actually be competitors um, in terms of, you know, unfortunately the, the, the policies that exist now, everyone is really trying to survive and everyone's trying to access whatever resources to maintain their survival as, a, mm. as, a, as an organization. And the work that's happening um, through this Greater Bronzeville Community Action Plan is saying, you know what, let's all work together to try to have collective impact. And that has actually had impact in terms of now for the past five years, I'm working with different units on campus, thanks to, to mm -hmm. the leadership that's happening in the community. Mm -hmm. And some of that work, including the Greater Bronzeville Neighborhood Network, you know, Bright Star was able to secure funding from United Way, but mm -hmm. the Office of Civic Engagement has been critical. And you've already mentioned the Office of Civic Engagement's Community Programs Accelerator mm -hmm. that provides, you know, training for nonprofit organization fundamentals, strategic planning, um, board development, you know, grants, um, funding, evaluation, you know, consultation that, so now that's a key cog to represent the strengths that exist in the community. I think that when it comes to issues around violence, um, a lot of times we focus on what's wrong instead of what's strong. Mm. And so it's very important for us to look at organizations like Ladies of Virtue, who are willing to work with other organizations in the community aimed towards having collective impact. And mm -hmm. so that is the benefit. Of course, our, our students at the university benefit now because you and I have a trusted relationship. So if I have a student who might be specifically interested in a particular type of program within this web, I can provide students with opportunities that are based off of trust. And mm -hmm. so, we benefit from that as well. But what it takes is organizations working together um, as well as the, in the university. And so I think that we're really in a good place where both of that is happening. And so in addition to the accelerator program, there's also the Civic Leadership Academy that's developed again out of the Office of Civic Engagement, um, the work that's going on around trauma-informed care, um, specifically through Urban Health Initiative and UChicago Medicine, working with community leaders um, understanding that they are the strengths and that we all need to work together. Mm, I love that. And I hope that there are some uh, nonprofit leaders listening so that they can get involved as well. Uh, and then my, my final question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about the type of organizations that you look for in terms of partnering uh, and what are the profiles of those organizations? Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I apologize if it's going to be a little repetitive to what I just mentioned, no. but I think that, you know, especially the last six months has really, or the last five months has really shown us um, some things have come out that we've already known. We have a lot of knowledge about what the problems are. And the issue is we all have knowledge. We have knowledge from the streets to the bookshelves and the ivory towers, right? Mm -hmm. The issue is taking what we know and putting it to practice. And mm -hmm. so like Ladies of Virtue, you, you know, you, you're highlighting Miss Jackie's, uh, Miss Jackie Scott's role. Are organizations not just talking to other adults and organizations? Are they involved in the parents? We're looking for organizations that know how to get parents involved. Mm -hmm. We're looking for organizations that know how to work across sectors with other organizations instead of viewing them as competitors. Mm -hmm. But we're just like you have, uh, you've had Sydney involved for the past four years, knowing how can we work with our youth to raise their critical consciousness to really challenge the way policies are made, systems are made, justifying the impact that organizations such as Ladies of Virtue have on their lives so we can get more funding to sustain the capacity of those programs. So we're looking for, for that. And it, it's really all around collaboration, right? How can we leverage these partnerships, not only with other organizations, but with businesses, with universities, with governmental agencies, with civic leaders, 
to make sure that we're combating these structural inequities because the issues are largely structural to make that make it difficult for our families, for our youth and for our communities. We're looking for organizations that are willing to partner to be coordinated um, around different approaches, not just simply seeing that their approach is the only approach, but collectively we can work together to have impact. Mm, I love that. And you mentioned uh working together to secure funding to sustain the capacity of those relationships. And I did uh, take some questions before this event to see if any of the nonprofit leaders had questions. And so a lot of it, uh, I guess not surprisingly, was around funding. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so that's so interesting that you mentioned that. And so I can go into uh, those the, the next two questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. So Absolutely. this one uh, came from Elaine Martho from Project Impact 180. And so this kind of gets to your point, Franklin, about the racial inequities, but she really wanted to highlight those inequities as it relates to funding. So we know that the need is often the greatest in our communities. However, grants and funds for people of color made up just 10% of domestic funding when considering grants over $10,000. And she's talking from the largest uh, 1,000 foundation uh, in, in the US. What shifts need to occur in order to increase funding to our local communities? And um, I can start off first and then I know, you know, you do a lot of work in the local communities and maybe you can add as well. Um, but one thing I wanted to highlight was really from an individual standpoint and from a um, nonprofit leader standpoint. From an individual standpoint, I think that we all have to come together um, because no one is going to save us. That's one thing that um, I we all have to realize. And so as we're waiting for companies and uh, other organizations and other corporations to really address those inequities, we as individuals have to take a stand in, within our own companies. And so one thing that we're asking individuals to do is to even ask your boss, ask your, your supervisors, your leadership team, to host a lunch and learn in those organizations so that they can even be aware of organizations like a Ladies of Virtue. Many times some of the uphill battles that we're trying to climb is that many companies don't aren't aware of us because they seek the larger organizations when trying to give out those funds. Uh, and one thing that we found is that when individuals, when vo our volunteers are asking their employers, hey, we need to put Ladies of Virtue on the forefront, we have seen fruit from those initiatives. Um, just even for Juneteenth, we had a volunteer to raise her hand to say, hey, stop going to, you know, we, we need to really focus on these black led non nonprofit grassroots organizations. And they did select Ladies of Virtue and we received 14,000 from that. And so that was our first time actually seeing um, you know, such a large donation coming from the employees, but that came from one person uh, who then pulled in another person who then pulled in another person. And next thing you know, um, you know, that organization, that company did choose Ladies of Virtue for their philanthropic efforts for Juneteenth, but that was not the original plan. So I, I really challenge individuals to know that you can make a difference um, by just challenging your companies and your organizations. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And also, I'll also add one more key point about what individuals can do is really give monthly to an organization, um, even if it's $10 or $20, because those monthly donations are um, is what's going to sustain uh, that small grassroots organization. A lot of times, at least pre-COVID, COVID, COVID uh, now things are a little bit different with grant funds being provided within sometimes four to six weeks of after, you know, after applying. But prior to COVID, I'll be honest with you, if I apply for a grant in January and if I actually received it, I may not have received those funds until May or June. So sometimes that's a four to six month process. So hopefully we don't go back to the pre-COVID era of, of the grant funding. But that can really hurt an organization. And so I do, uh, I will, uh, you know, say that plea to individuals to give even a monthly donation and that could help in terms of funding. Um, and then, uh, you know, Franklin, do you have anything from just a corporation, a corporate standpoint? Yeah, you know, um, I'm not necessarily, obviously, I have a, a research background, right. mm -hmm. background at the university. So, um, I will speak to how the community organizing has generated funds. Uh, I want to definitely validate 
um, the the um, the statistics that um, the one person um, had had uh, provided us, and that part of that is what are we doing to activate um, our critical consciousness or awareness mm. of the issues, like using data to inform what's really going on, using history mm -hmm. to inform, just like the work that we're doing with Sydney. And it cannot be just organizations, you know, executive directors or key members talking to each other. We have to do like you're doing, Jamila. You have to engage you. You have to engage parents because what you need to do is that you need to get a larger voice, you know, that's really saying we demand equity and it can't just come from organizations. It has to come from the community because, you know, unfortunately, the way we've always worked is that in this system, voters pay, pay attention to voices, right? And, and so the more that we can inform around real history, the more we can raise critical awareness, the more we can get youth involved, parents involved, because now they're speaking truth. Mm -hmm. Again, we know what the issues are. A lot of times what's happening is that we're gaslit it. Like, you know, we're, we're told that what we think is the problem, just like what happened to George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Oh, he didn't really <laughs> die that way. It wasn't from that. He actually had a pre-existing condition. No, no, that is consistent in terms of what we already know. So right. we need to make sure that we don't just look at it as an organization, but we look at it with the voice of youth. We get them involved and our parents. But here's the other part that I want to speak to really quickly. Mm -hmm. And this, this demonstrates what we're, what we're doing through the leadership of this network that we're involved in is convened by Bright Star that, that Ladies of Virtue is a part of with the Bronzeville Community Action Plan. Mm -hmm. Well, this work, when we talk and we, we have community meetings and we listen to our stakeholders, we get them engaged. What that does is it increases exposure. And so that community mm -hmm. action plan itself brought attention, you know, thanks to the leadership of Pastor Harris from the MacArthur Foundation. And what larger organizations or businesses, um, one thing that they can do that has happened in the past year is that MacArthur said, we love this community action plan. We're going to fund you a million dollars to mm -hmm. implement this, right? Now, keep in mind, a lot of this work had already had funding, but this is additional funding and capacity that's needed to, to actually execute this work. And so as a convener, like what Bright Star did, instead of saying, all right, we're going to just keep it all for us. No, we're going to have a call. We want to find out for, for, the, for each year, who's, who are the experts? This first year is around who are the experts when it comes to, guess what? Parental engagement. That's pretty important, right? And so what, what happened is that um, you had 250,000 for each year would be distribu distributed, distributed, excuse me, across different organizations. So in year one, it was distributed across seven different community organizations that have expertise in parental engagement, which yeah. again is a key component. So what are we doing as businesses or organizations to generate funding that will benefit other organizations? We have to look at ourselves as conveners and not competitors. We have to do it collectively. That is so true. I'm so glad you brought up Bright Star as it relates to that because there was a second question um, from Dara Michelle from Focus Fairies Mentoring. How can partnerships lead to grant funding? And so I can mention um, my experience with Bright Star because that actually just happened. And so I started partnering with Bright Star Community Outreach three years, ooh, almost four years ago at this point. Oh, time is really flying. Um, but at that time, I was not uh, thinking about, you know, grant funding from Bright Star Community Outreach, right? It was really, uh, I was partnering with them because they were working on a workforce development committee. And I, as I mentioned prior, you know, in the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that I truly want Ladies of Virtue to be a pillar of the community and really meeting the needs of the community at large and not just uh, mentoring. I want to partner with organizations so that we can really uh, hit the the major issues of our of our communities, which is workforce development and some of the other issues. And so by just having that passion of wanting to improve the community, um, that's how I ended up partnering with the Chicago Urban League and some of the other organizations, the Love Institutes as part of Bright Star. And we just broke out into committees and we really tackled education and workforce development and all of that. Uh, and now fast forward three and a half years later, 
they end up getting that grant that uh, Franklin just mentioned uh, in terms of from MacArthur to really hone in on uh, parent engagement. And we were well suited for that because as Jackie mentioned earlier, we have our parent support groups, we have our, our parent network, we, we meet with them, we talk about mental health and how to improve communication. Like we were, we're doing these things, but our families wanted even more. Um, and I'm looking like, well, what money? <laughs> and so that, um, that grant opportunity came at the right time. I did not know that it was going to come, but because I have been a faithful member of Bright Star Community Outreach, the, the Workforce Development Committee, I was well suited and positioned to win that grant. And we did. We did win this past January. And so we've been able to do even more uh, with that grant opportunity. And so one of my, my, my advice would be that funding shouldn't be your North Star all the time when you're looking at um, those partnerships, it really should be focused on your own vision, your own passion, um, your own building the relationship that you have with that partner. And then fruit comes after that. I always say that, right? Like blessings come from that. You know, there's things that come down the line, but that wasn't my main focus when I uh, got into partnership with University of Chicago or Bright Star. Um, it really was about how can we improve the city of Chicago? Um, and I always like to thank my old boss from Learn. Shout out to Greg White, who's the CEO of uh, Learn Charter School. But he used to always say, uh, build, what, uh, build your well before you're thirsty. And basically, that just means, you know, serve, um, you know, do what you need to do, help others. And then you never know that, you know, you'll get your water later. You know, when you're thirsty, you'll be able to get that water so that you can drink later. But right now, Dig your will, build your will, help others, serve the community, um, you know, look for a, a greater cause than yourself, and then those things will come. Anything else you would like to add, Franklin? No, I think you you nailed it. Um, you know, what I've learned is, is, is basically right along, well aligned with that metaphor about building the well. And really, it's focus on relationships first, mm -hmm. and money will follow. Right. And so, as you mentioned, being a part of working groups. Right. You know that this is the impact that you want to have. You don't you should not wait for money to drive you. You should you should let the mission drive you. And and so that is around the mission is around building that well, because, you know, you need water to sustain <laughs> life. Right? right. So, yes, that was that was well put. Well put. No uh -huh. pun intended. <laughs> Well, we are winding down. If we, you know, if there is one question we can take from the audience, is there one? If not, we will move forward. Yes. Oh, hey, Kahari. So our Bright Star family is in the building. <laughs> uh, we love you guys. Well, if there are no questions, I just want to thank Franklin for his time. And I have a plaque that I'm going to mail to you, Franklin. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> but That's it says, awesome. It says, with our greatest appreciate, appreciation, we are, we hereby acknowledge Franklin Kosi Gay, Executive Director of the Chicago Youth Center for Youth Violence Prevention at the University of Chicago, in recognition of your passion, unwavering commitment to making Ch Chicago a better place, and dedicated partnership to Ladies of Virtue. Thank you for all that you do. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm Thank you. I'm going to it to you. <laughs> I'm deeply moved. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining. And thank you. Uh, and we can bring back Jackie and Sydney so we can just thank them for their time. Thank you, Sydney. Thank and you. Thank you. Appreciate you guys so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all for joining. No problem. No Bye. problem. <laughs> Bye. Have a good one. Thank you very much. You too. Take care, you guys.